Welcome to the 2014 World Dairy Expo and uh, today's seminar, The Impact of Feeding Calves Three Times a Day Versus Twice a Day. Uh, my name is Larry Van Ruckel. I'm with Land Lakes Animal Milk Products and uh, we are pleased to be the sponsor of today's talk. Uh, and I have got, had the privilege of introducing uh, your speaker today. Don Socket is a veterinary epidemiologist, microbiologist at the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at the University of Wisconsin here in Madison. Uh, he is recognized internationally for his work on infectious diseases of cat livestock, particularly dairy cattle, and is a, as a practicing veterinarian and livestock um, and at, at the diagnostic lab, lab, he is responsible for diagnostic cases that are submitted to the laboratory by practicing veterinarians and livestock producers. He also does outreach education for the, the diagnostic lab. I've known Don for over 16 years, and uh, there are very few people that have as much passion for the industry as Don, and he has worked really hard and has, a, has had a, a big impact on our industry way beyond what his work at the diagnostic lab. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him. The seminar uh, has been approved for continuing education credits uh, from the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists and the American Association of Veterinary State Boards programs. Forms are available at the back if you're interested in these credits. Um, as a kind of a, a, a to, as to be kind to everybody around you, please mute your phones at this time. And uh, again, it is my privilege to introduce Don and, and uh, share his knowledge with us. Well, thank you, Larry. Can everybody hear me okay? That, that's good. Well, um, it's so much fun to be here today. And welcome to the great state of Wisconsin, and particularly to Madison. We're very proud of our state and our city, and I hope you have a wonderful time at Dairy Expo, and I encourage you to come back as often as, you, as possible. Um, one thing that, uh, just a little bit of background, and thank you, uh, this research would not be possible without the financial support of, of Land O'Lakes and the cooperation of the USDA uh, dairy Research Herd, which is located in Sauk City, Wisconsin. Um, the genesis of this idea occurred to myself and Dr. Tom Earlywine and another uh, individual at 2 a.m. in the morning when we were driving in California to get ready for the next day's session of Calf Talk. And we were reminiscing amongst ourselves. We're quite familiar with all the research that, that's come from uh, uh, Jim Drake at University of Illinois and Mike Van Amberg at Cornell University of the benefits of feeding calves uh, a higher plane nutrition, which they call full potential feeding. So we're driving along, we're talking, and uh, Dr. Early Wine, we had him busy on his laptop doing calculations to figure out what group size and everything. And we said to ourselves, calves are babies. Babies nurse their mothers multiple times a day. What would happen if we allowed our calves to have the ability to nurse their mother more than twice a day? Really basic question. And you know what's kind of funny is, um, I'm fortunate at work, I w at work I work with a lot of very intelligent people, but I have my most powerful interactions when I talk about calves with mothers and grandmothers. Men are useless, but grandmothers and mothers are very good to give you insight. And this is a funny story and I'll start my talk. Where the research was starting to come in and it was looking very good for the benefits of feeding three times a day. And I was at a, uh, a retirement party for somebody who retired from, who I'd known for several years. And I talked to somebody who was a mother, and I explained the study, and I got all excited. And she stopped me and said, wait a minute. 
did the state of Wisconsin taxpayers pay for this research? Uh, I said, no, well, some, but mostly it was the industry supportive. He said, I hope the state didn't pay any money for your research. And I was taken back by it. And I said, what do you mean? He says, every mother in the world knows this be a baby's going to do better if you feed it three times a day than twice a day. Why do you have to do research to prove the obvious? <laughs> and I, 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 that, that had a profound impact on me. And, you know, so, so, I, so we've been feeding our calves not properly for over 100 years. And, it's my, and this research will show you that five, ten years from now, the normal standard in our industry will be feeding our calves a minimum of three meals a day. You will be looked upon as Neanderthal if you feed once or twice a day. So that's the impact of the study. Uh, we got to bed, of it. we talked about the study at 5 a.m. in the morning. We had to get up at 7 to go to our next talk. So that's how excited we were about it. So I love calves. To me, the most perfect animal in the world for me to think about is dairy calves. I, 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 all I do is think about calves. I spend about 80% of my time thinking about calves. And because I have the privilege to work in Wisconsin, that gives me an advantage over many other veterinarians in the country is because we are blessed in Wisconsin with a tremendous dairy infrastructure. We got large number of herds, lots of dairy cattle, world-class veterinarians, world-class industry people in all walks of life. And I get the privilege of seeing all these samples come into our lab. And so we're, I'm lucky enough that I'll see as much samples in a week or a month as many other diagnostic samples we'll see from dairy calves in a year. So it gives me the ability to have insight that other people don't have be just because of the uniqueness of being having the privilege to work in Wisconsin. So let's just talk a little bit of basics for a minute. Most dairy calves in the United States are fed twice a day. Why do, they, why do we do that? Because historically, we milked our cows twice a day, and we fed the, 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 the fresh milk from the cows to our calves. So it's, it's custom. Now, a normal calf, when in the first couple weeks of life, you will nurse their mother 8 to 12 times a day for the first week of life. And then as they get, as they get bigger and, there's, and, they, and, and, and they start growing, they start nursing larger volumes per meal and less frequently. But, but by a month of age, they're still nursing on an average of four times a day. We see a lot of problems with calves at our laboratory where we see unhealthy abomasins or stomachs. And so if the animal passes away, it's not uncommon to see abomasitis, abomasal disease, in a quarter to a third of our calves. I think a lot of this is related to two things. First off, the milk or milk replacement diet that the calves are consuming is too high in bacterial counts, which will cause, uh, and I've seen this many times, that high bacterial counts in milk or milk replacement will cause abomasitis. And you get a very predictable syndrome that you see in these calves. They'll, they're inconsistent feed intakes. And if you ever had, uh, had a uh, problem with your own stomach, you know when you start feeling better, you eat a meal, and then you start hurting. We see this all the time in our calves. The other problem is I think it's because we're feeding our calves twice a day will predispose you to it as well. There's some interesting research done by Dr. Uh, Peter Constable. Uh, many years ago, where he showed that when calves were fed three or more meals a day, it had a beneficial effect on the abomasin, particularly on the pH or gastric acid. When he f what he found is when calves were fed twice a day, the abomasin sat empty for too long and s on very low pHs, which he speculated would predispose the calves to developing ulcerations. 
So the feeding frequency, this is a hypothesis, it's not been proven. Feeding clean, low bacterial count milk three or more times a day may reduce the risk of albumasitis and ulcers in neonatal calves. And this is Dr. Constable Gradstein that published this in the Journal of Dairy Science in 2002. We, I hate to tell you, we do still get wrecks. And nobody wants to deal with large groups of dead calves because calves, because they're babies and they're vulnerable, we take, we, there's a tremendous human bond with our, with our calves. It's a normal thing to do. And I worry a lot about the health and well-being of the calf care givers when things are not going well with their calves. And I spent a lot of time making them say, it's not your fault, we're gonna fix it, and things are gonna get better. I, 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 spend, I think it's very important for us to do that, that we educate our producers that many times it's not your fault, and we're gonna do some things to help you. And they really appreciate that. So these are some cases I've had over the years, you know, you, some really bad things can happen with our calves. And this is this abomasitis I'm telling you about. They come in, you see a lot of redness and hemorrhage and, and, and edema in, in that organ. And the cause of that was never determined. It's just we didn't find clostridium perfringens type A in, in other pathogens. So it's out there and we see it. Now, so the premises of the idea was is we're gonna take calves and we're gonna put them on a full potential diet. And the only difference is are they fed twice a day or three times a day? So the total milk replacer intake in pounds of dry matter was the same whether they're fed twice a day or three times a day. Are you with me? Okay. Now, all the calves were weighed with a scale shortly after they were born they all got the same colostrum source. We tried to control for as many variables as we could so we could measure a real difference in what was going on with the calves. So we fed them all the same colostrum. Many of the stu studies that you read, they're using farm source colostrum and they don't control for that in their study design, which makes me question sometimes their results. So I, hate research on calves when there's no data provided on the colostrum status of the animals and they're not randomized to, to the different groups of treatments based on their colostrum status or failure of passive transfer. So all the calves were fed 150 grams of a commercial colostrum replacement product within six hours after birth. A blood sample was drawn from was drawn from each calf at one to three days of age from the jugular vein, and the serum was spun down and frozen, and all the serum was tested for failure of passive transfer using the gold standard test, which is called the radial immune diffusion test. The calves were raised outside in individual calf hutches until they were moved, weaned and moved to group uh, housing pens around 50 to 55 days of age. This is what they were fed. The, during the first week of life, the calves were fed a full potential milk replacer with 28% protein and 20% fat. And they were randomly assigned either two or three times a day, a day feeding. All the calves were fed at eight o'clock in the morning and at, at nine o'clock at night. The, the three times a, uh, a day feeding calves were fed at 2.30 in the afternoon. So there was a 13 hour window from morning to um, evening feeding. And I learned a lot in this study is how to get work done. Um, see the calf caregivers at the place did the work for us. And what I did is we sat down, we, we, we explained the study, what we want to look at. And, the calf, and I said to calf feeders, you figure out how to accomplish the three times a day feeding. And they figured out how to do it. So basically, the regular calf care giver, uh, the reason they were fed at 8 o'clock in the morning is just before he left at the end of the, he fed the morning and the afternoon at 2.30.
just before he left at the end of the day, he had all the milk replacer powder pre-weighed, ready to go for all the calves for the evening feeding. So all the people who milked the cows had to do is they, they came over, they mixed up the milk replacer, went out, and they fed in buckets, and they left the bucket with the calf overnight, and then the next morning he would pick up the bucket, and he'd have to go through and wash and clean and sanitize all the calf feeding equipment, and then feed the calves. So it's pretty ingenious how they figured out how to do it. The, um, so basically the calves were fed 1.8 pounds of milk replacer powder through the first week of life. That's total per day, so that'd be split in pe uh, feedings. And then they're fed two and a half pounds of milk replacer uh, per day for, from day eight to day 42 or six weeks. And then they're fed a pound a quarter of milk replacer on the uh, seventh week of life. And the calves were offered free choice calf starter with 20% cr crude protein beginning at three uh, days of age. Yes, that we're gonna get to that. Okay, there's 35 calves in each group. Okay, so the study started in March and, and first calf was enrolled in early March, the last calf was enrolled in late July. We met, the calf star intake was measured daily. They measured the refusals. Uh, so uh, until the calves reached 50 days of age. The hip height and body weight was, was measured weekly by the same individual. All the body weights were done on a scale. The data we had was the calf's birth weight, uh, what their serum immunoglobulin status was at, uh, within, uh, at within 24 to 48 hours after birth, their hip height, weight, we measured their weight gain, their feed efficiency, their calf star intake, looked at um, age of first calving, what the milk yield was, and this is just a statistical uh, package that we used for analysis of the data. We also looked at the where there was a difference in the probability the calves would enter the herd as a lactating female uh, two years later. So are you with me here? 35 calves randomly assigned outside in calf hutches. They're either fed twice or three times a day. They got the same amount of milk replacer powder per day. The only difference was it was divided in two or three feedings. Pretty simple stuff, right? This is where the research was done. And I cannot thank the, the professionalism and the quality of the staff up there. They were awesome, really good people. This is, uh, this is where the milk replacer powder was mixed up. Calves are outside in individual calf hutches. They're pretty happy there. So th that's basically pretty typical Wisconsin way to raise them in calf hutches. Randomly assigned, uh, either getting two or three times a day feed. So you, and so we measured the daily calf starter intake, weight, weight gain once a week, and a height gain. Are, are we all with me? Okay. So there's 35 calves per group. There was no difference in their body weight, and there was no difference statistically in failure of passive transfer. And we fed the same colostrum to each and every calf so the differences we see in the biological outcome of these calves cannot be, ex cannot be explained by a difference of colostrum quality. Okay, when the calves are fed twice a day, okay, this is the, there was no difference in calf starter intake the first three weeks. There was, uh, there was no difference in calf starter intake from uh, days uh, to the first three weeks or, or the first six weeks of the study. However, once we started the weaning process, feeding them once a day to get them ready to transition to be a fully functional ruminant, there was a, uh, a marked increase in calf starter intake between the calves that were fed three times a day or twice a day. Now, does anyone want to hazard a guess why they ate more calf starters? They're a bigger animal. Okay, they're hungry. They're hungry. They're bigger animals. Their maintenance costs are higher. They're hungrier. Okay. Now, I could have broke this down to ten days of age once we started the study. The calves were already bigger at ten days of age. 
fed three times a day. Isn't that amazing? Ten days of age, they're already bigger. That's amazing. Are you surprised by that, sir? They're fed the same amount of milk replacement powder per day. So isn't it amazing that if we feed babies more like mama does, they do better? Gosh. Right? OK, so at three weeks of age, look at these, these values here. It's not due to random chance. They're bigger. So, so they're uh, so one to 20 times a day. This is the weight gain, 12 and a half kilograms versus 14.9. This is um, during the six-week study, basically five more kilograms, about 10 pounds more weight gain, right? They're about an inch higher. Right? At the end of the study. Look at the difference in feed efficiency. 68 in the first 21 days of life. 68% of that milk replacement that was fed to those calves produced growth. That's remarkable. That's amazing. That's awesome. This is milk replacer is the most expensive feed that you will ever feed to any animal in your herd, milk or milk replacer. Why wouldn't you feed it in a, ma in a manner that you get maximum utilization of the nutrients? Think about that. Okay, so uh, over the six-week period, we had a 60% feed efficiency. And look at the p-value there. That's amazing. That's telling you it's a 1 in 100,000, 10,000 chance that this is due to randomness. So this is a real observation. Now, there's 35 calves uh, in each group. 32 were weaned successfully in the 2X feeding. 34 were weaned successfully in the 3X feeding. No statistical difference. The number it added in it, the lactating herd, 28 of 35 heifers gave birth to a calf or ended up lactating in the herd. 34 of 35 calves fed three times a day entered the herd. So in this study, and th this is just what's missing, the age of first calving was younger, it was trending that way, and there was, uh, there was, there was basically 500 kilograms more milk production, which is not statistically significant, but we did not have a large group size. So what we found in this study was for every six calves that were fed three times a day, one more heifer ended up lactating in that herd. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. And when you go back and you check the records and ask yourself, well, why aren't they entering the herd? There's, not, there's, there's no pattern in the records that they could explain it. Some of them did not get bred, some of them aborted. It, it was just all over the map. So, so the most powerful thing was, after the study was concluded, one th a couple things that really struck home in my head is I had all these data written down on individual calf starter intake, and I had to put it all myself into a spreadsheet. It took me about 100 hours to put that in there. But it was good for me in this way. Um, boy, I had no idea how much variability there is in calf starter intake in the first four weeks of life. When the calves are purposely healthy, when you check the health record. So you can have calves going along in half a pound of milk uh, calf starter for two, three, four days, and then <coughs> something happens. I don't know. They, they cut their intake in half. Or they might not eat any for a couple of days, and then they start eating again. Have you noticed the same thing about the, vari the extreme variability, individual variability between calves and calf starter intake in the first month of life? That's normal. So that's why it's one, well one thing that really strikes home is that's why you got to feed just enough calf starter that the calf consumes in a 24-hour period if you put it in once a day that you can observe these differences. You don't want a lot of calf starter there, then you have no idea what they're consuming. 
So the, when, we, when we were done this study, we went out, Dr. Early and and myself, we went out to the staff who fed and cared for the calves to thank them for the study, to, to appreciate all their hard work and everything that they did. And we sat there. And when we were done, I, we asked this very basic question. Could you tell the difference between calves that were fed twice a day or three times a day? And they all nodded. And I said, and this is before the calves, you could tell a difference in body size, right? So I asked the calf feeders, could you tell the difference? They all nodded ahead and said yes. And Maureen, I said, what do you, well, tell me what you saw. And they said, it's a subjective thing. It's hard to put your, to describe it. They're just a better calf. They're happier, they're friskier, they're more with the program, they got more energy, they're jumping around more, they're just a better calf. I don't know how else to describe it. And they, so, it was so powerful. And they could tell, after about two or three weeks, by watching the calves, how frisky they were and how they were doing. They didn't have to look at the charts to know if they're 2X or 3X feeding. They could tell subjectively the difference between the calves. That was amazing to me. I never, w the two, the, the, the three most ex uh, interesting things that we found in the study was how quickly they start gaining more weight and height and how much, and how much quickly the, the calves are healthier and more frisky. And then we never, ever expected that a, that such a high proportion of the calves that were fed three times a day would enter the lactation herd. Just so you know, in the United States, uh, 28 to 35, which is or whatever, was around 80%, whatever that number is, is about pretty close to the national average in the United States. It is just unheard of to have 95, 96% of calves that are born enter the lactating herd. That just, just doesn't happen. And so then you start speculating and you could say, well, there must be an epigen epigenetic reason for this. Epigenetics means that things that occur in the calf's environment affect gene expression for, for either the, uh, for the benefit of the animal. So there must be some epigenetic effects going on in the herd. So the calves fed three times a day and had improved growth, hip height, and weight gain than calves fed twice a day. The same caloric intake and protein. Calves fed three times a day had better feed efficiency. My goodness, with the cost of milk or milk replacer, feed it three times a day. Get that efficient growth because there's short-term and long-term benefits. The long-term benefits is we know the more the calves grow in the free weaning period, we now unequivocally know that it leads to, uh, as a lactating animal in the herd, they, it enhances future milk production and longevity in the herd. Calves fed three times a day consume more calf star than calves fed twice a day during the pre-weaning process when, they're, when we went, from tw uh, went to once a day feeding on both the calves. Calves fed three times a day were more likely to enter lactation than calves fed twice a day. And for every six calves fed three times a day, one additional heifer entered lactation. Gentlemen and women, feeding a baby twice a day has adverse effects that we have not been adequately measuring in the past. This is an indication of the harm we're doing to our animals by only feeding them twice a day. It's not normal for a baby to, to nurse or be fed twice a day. Dairy calves fed three or more meals a day are healthier than calves fed twice a day. The labor costs do not increase much because there are fewer sick calves to treat. So I got my pen and pencil out and I figured what would you, how much, what is your break even point in this study? What could you have to pay that person per hour to feed that third feeding? And it turned out to be not quite $100 an hour. I wish I could make $100 an hour. Would you like to make $100 an hour? Yeah, I would too, okay? But your labor costs really don't go up because the calves are healthier. Less calves on electrolytes, less calves needing shots, all that stuff. 
Feeding calves three or more meals a day can overcome some of the harmful effects of calves not receiving an adequate volume of high quality colostrum within two hours of birth. I'll show you that data. And our benchmark, if you're on the farm, using a handheld serum refractometer, is we want 80% of our calves to have a total serum, uh, uh, to total serum proteins of 5.5 grams per higher, or, or 5.5 grams per deciliter higher. So that's my son. I'd like to show you a horse. That's that's on, uh, that, that's uh, was it taken at Louisville, Kentucky, and that's a, he's a reserve world champion there. So, this is the, the <laughs> isn't he handsome? <laughs> now, he's six feet tall. He weighs 128 pounds, and he's got a 27 inch waist. He was fed as much as he wants. And you know, it must be his metabolism because uh, when he goes out with friends and the girls are teasing him, uh, they said, What's your, how do you stay so thin? He says, the secret is french fries. <laughs> that, that annoys him, but anyhow. <laughs> this is what we found. Uh, this work needs to be repeated. But this, is oh, 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 sorry. Failure passive transfer is defined as less than 10 milligrams per mil milliliter of serum IgG, and not failure of passive transfer is greater than 10. So when we had uh, the calves that were fed, they had failure of passive transfer, right? Whether they, uh, whether they entered the herd, okay? If they're fed twice a day, 13 of 19 entered the herd at failure of passive transfer. If we fed them, uh, if, if they did not have failure or passive transfer, 15 of 16 entered the herd, okay? So colostrum is all part of this. But if we fed them three times a day, if we had failure or passive transfer, 15 of 16 entered the herd. And everyone that did not have failure or passive transfer entered the herd. So what this study shows is part of what's going on here is feeding these babies three times a day. You can overcome some of the de deleterious effects of calves not getting enough hep uh, colostrum, uh, uh, having failure of passive transfer is probably a better way to say it, and have low serum immunoglobulin levels. And, you know, we will, uh, just to finish up here, and then I'll take some questions. Every dairyman that I talk to, I, I really hate talking about colostrum to dairymen. Maureen, are you, are you, are you sick of hearing about colostrum? Be honest no, with me. Not. You're not? But I wonder if people are sick of the herd. Is there producers in the her room here? How many are sick of hearing about somebody yammering about colostrum and failure of passive transfer? Come on, be honest. You're all sick of it, right? So, but if you really think about it, there's so many things have to go right not to have failure of passive transfer. The calf uh, has to be born on an eventful delivery. No dystocia. The calf has to be at term, no twins. The calf has to get good quality colostrum with sufficient quality quantity with low bacterial counts in the first two hours of life, right? There's a lot of things that can control along. You can't control all the variables on colostrum. It's impossible. It's a dynamic process. There's randomness to it. But the beauty of three times a day feeding is we can control that variable. That's something that it, you feed three times a day, every calf will be fed three times a day. And the most important thing when you're raising babies is consistency and controlling your, your variables. Okay? And so thank you, Lan uh, Land Lake Purina Feed, for sponsoring the research. Thank you for the dairy research, forage research facility in Sox City for for providing the labor, and my employer for giving me the opportunity to do a little, uh, little research outside my main job responsibilities, and it's been a wonderful journey. And I expect 10 years from now, the discussion will be not whether we should feed three times a day, but the discussion will be what is the benefit between feeding three times a day versus more frequent feeding, whether whether much, there's much benefit from going from three to four feedings per day. That is where the research is going. 
So I'll be like happy entertaining questions from the audience. Yes. question is what is the what how narrow a window between the first and last feeding on the three times a day feeding can you go and the answer to the question is is I'm not aware of any research that has carefully looked at that but subjectively with field experience and stuff I I like a, a minimum of 13 preferably 14 hours between the, the first and last feeding of the day does that answer your question? So when you talk about three, uh, three times a day feeding, everybody thinks, oh my God, I gotta get up midnight. I wanna sleep, I don't wanna go out there at midnight. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't have to tweak your schedule that much uh, to get that third feeding in. But you need at least a 13, 14 hour window. In a perfect world, it'd be nice to have eight hours between every feeding, but that's not reality. Yes. How about the following question? You know, the research is that if you eat seven days a week, you still have seven days a week. Our, our assumption is that the animals were not provided with food that was disposed of during the day by people that had jobs. So the earlier traits of their uh, ability to make their prey and so forth are impaired. So in effect, But the question is, is, is to paraphrase, can you get away with maybe feeding them three times a day the first month of life and then going to twice a day feeding with a larger volume? That research has been done, and yes, you can do that. I'm not aware whether they compared the results if you would have kept the three times a day feeding throughout the entire feeding period. But it's really critical, in particularly in that first three-week window of life that they get more, three or more meals a day. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm aware of a trial in the South where they looked at the, the difference between feeding a calf once a day or twice a day and they couldn't show any benefit. Is that the study he's referring to? Well, that's insanity because babies, it's not, it's, if it's not normal, it, they need three or more meals a day. So what that study is telling you, the performance is horrible. So basically what the study told you is it's really bad to feed a baby two meals a day. One or two, there's no difference in the outcome you feed them one or two meals a day. They need that third meal. Oh, it was on a starvation diet. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. The question is, is on automated calf feeders where they have the better, um, if, if, they're on a, if they're fed uh, three or more meals per day and it's a full potential diet, they, they do just fine. And you'll see this kind of growth. Is that answering your question? Yes. I'm not a nutritionist, but the question is, if you fed him even more than what was fed in the study, I, th I uh, there has been ad libitum studies done, where ad libitum, usually with automated calf feeders, ad libitum just means, hey, eat what you want, right? And those calves always do the best in ad libitum feeding, in terms of health, well-being, uh, and rate of, uh, and efficiency of growth, Lean growth.
your, your question is, and I, I'm not a nutritionist, but um, Dr. Earlywine, could you answer that question, please? The question is, is could you... Uh, His question is, what is the uh, minimum protein and how impro important the protein is? Is that basically? Okay. We have done some research in that area, and, and one of the, the comparisons we did was just a 20-20 milk replacer to a 28% pro percent protein, 20% fat milk replacer, and fed them at the same exact feeding rate. And essentially, we got about 20 pounds more gain plus additional frame growth when we so they got taller and longer when we fed them the 28% the protein, which kind of makes sense. That's what whole milk is when it's on a dry basis is about 26 to 28% protein. So to think that 20% protein does it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if they aren't growing very fast, you don't need as much protein. But if they're growing fast, you need the protein. That's, it's related to their lean tissue growth. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Right. I think the question, if I answer, is if you're feeding three quarts of milk replacer at 15% total solids twice a day, and you went to a third feeding and added an additional uh, three, qu uh, three quarts of milk replacer at 15% total solids? Is that what your question is? So the calves getting fed three times a day are going to get more nutrition in the 24-hour period? Yeah. They're going to grow a lot more. Oh, okay. The question, I understand the question, I think. You say, two, instead of feeding two quarts twice a day, how would they do if you fed two quarts three times a day? Oh, well, they're going to do much better because you're, in, you're providing a lot more nutrition for the calves, and they're going to grow better, right? And just so you to put it in perspective, uh, most of the, uh, the research has been done on beef calves, but when beef calves are nursing their mother in around two, three weeks, two to four weeks of age, they're drinking 20 to 28% of their body weight in milk per day. So you do the calculation on a dairy calf, a Holstein calf, you're talking the minimum amount of milk these calves heifers would be drinking and normally in nature is two gallons a day up to three to three and a half gallons per day. And a gallon of milk is about a pound of dry matter. So three gallons of milk is about three pounds of dry matter. Is there any other questions? Yes. What, my horse? Nothing in particular. Sometimes it's respiratory. Sometimes it's, it was nothing. It was not any one thing. There, there was, uh, uh, there was a health index uh, recorded daily. Okay, and and there was no. Uh, there's no statistical difference between the health index between calves fed twice a day and three times a day w that was measured by treatments for bovine respiratory disease, uh, treatment for uh, neo neo calf diarrhea or scours. There was no difference that way in the study. Yes.
Mm-hmm. The question is, is um, he's asked me health uh, vaccination immunization questions. So I have to, I say, since I've not established a valid client-patient relationship with your herd, I cannot give you specific recommendations because the quickest way for me to get every veterinarian in the state of Wisconsin mad at me is to tell them they're immunizing their animals incorrectly. <laughs> but, um, and there are, unlike uh, other breeds like dogs, cats, and horses, there are no national guidelines that says what you should be immunizing for. That all said, all the, all the cows and heifers were vaccinated with a commercial uh, scours vaccine according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad the weather's nice. Thank you, everyone. Did anybody pick up on that passion I was talking about? <laughs> Any indication of that? Thank you very much, Don. Thanks for coming to the seminar. Uh, Land Lakes is a proud sponsor of the seminar. Please fill out your valuation form. Uh, and oh, by the way, as a token of our appreciation, please um, help yourself to a We Care for Calves t-shirt, various sizes available. And again, thank you. Thank you for coming to the World Dairy Expo. Enjoy yourself.